Good evening and welcome. Tonight we're going to continue our read-through of Art That Changed the World. Now, what's interesting is that I am covering Egypt on my channel right now, and our next chapter just happens to be on Egyptian art. So, I have this a little closer than usual, just so I could get a better view of all the, the words because um, it gets pretty tiny over here. I think I need to start investing in reading glasses. But we start off with the most famous artifact from ancient Egypt, Tutankhamun's burial mask, circa 1324 BCE. This can be found in the Egyptian Museum in Cairo, Egypt. But let's read our introduction here. This era is from the 3rd millennium BCE to 30 BCE. And this chapter is called The Cult of the Dead. Ooh, spooky. Egyptian art made a significant contribution to the development of Western culture. The Greeks, in particular, were dazzled by its sheer monumentality, and through them some aspects of the Egyptian style filtered through to later ages. Even so, the aims and methods of Egyptian art are in many ways remote in spirit as well as time. Egyptian painting was entirely functional in its outlook. Artists were expected to depict their given subjects competently, according to a strictly regulated set of standards, and there was no place for originality, aesthetic considerations, or self-expression. The painters themselves had little status, certainly no better than other craftsmen, and they probably worked in teams. The Egyptians believed fervently in an afterlife, and directed much of their artistic energy into providing for it. The staggering amount of care and expense that is that this involved can be gauged from the magnificent wall decoration and treasures found in the tomb of Tutankhamun, who reigned as king during the artistic golden age of the 18th dynasty. Here we go. Moving on to our context section. Order and stability is the theme of Egyptian art. The Egyptian civilization is remarkable both for its richness and its longevity. It survived for around 3,000 years, producing art of a consistently high quality for most of this period. The River Nile, with its annual pattern of flooding, provided the fertile conditions that allowed the country's agricultural economy to prosper. This in turn gave Egypt the financial muscle to dominate its immediate neighbors during the Old Kingdom period. From a very early stage, Egypt's funerary beliefs were well established. The first pyramids emerged in the Third Dynasty, and were not straightforward tombs. They were houses for the Ka, or spirit of the deceased, with treasures placed inside them for use in the afterlife. They were attached to large estates, which produced food and other goods for offerings, while also supporting the local community. Farming activities were often portrayed inside the tomb. Because they were essentially religious in character, paintings were rigorously controlled. The human form had to be shown in its entirety, so artists combined a side and frontal view. This gives the figures a contorted appearance, and produces some curious anomalies. In the figure of Nebba Moon, which we'll see later, for example, the left hand is attached to the right arm. Frivolous ephemeral features, such as emotion or movement, were banished. The size of a figure reflected its importance, and skin color was predetermined. Red for men, cream for women, and a yellow symbolizing immortality for gods. The regulations remained in force for most of the history of ancient Egypt, though they were observed less strictly in times of political strife, such as the intermediate periods. The Jebelin murals, which we'll see later also, offered an example of this. The rules were also modified during the turbulent reign of Akhenaten, as can be seen in the paintings of his daughters, which again, Coming up, it's a beautiful painting. It, depict, it displays both movement and human interaction. The old traditions only began to wane after the collapse of the new kingdom, when waves of foreigners, 
Persians, Kushites, Greeks, and Romans threatened the country. Let's take a quick look at this gorgeous wall over here. This is from the tomb of Prince Kamwasit. It's in the Valley of the Queens in Luxor, Egypt. But why don't we take a look at the timeline of events during this era of art, a resilient nation. So circa 2647 to 2124 BCE. The Old Kingdom period comprises the 3rd to the 8th dynasty. Um, Kufrin, Chefrin, the model for the Sphinx is one of its rulers. Circa 20, I've never heard of him. Circa 2040 to 1648 BCE. In the Middle Kingdom period, a revival of Egypt's political fortunes follows the reunification of the country. Circa 1540 to 1069 BCE. In the New Kingdom period, the military triumphs of Ahmos usher in a new period of greatness. Circa 1540 to 1295 BCE, the 18th dynasty, regarded by many as the high point of Egyptian art, includes the eventful reigns of Akhenaten and Tutankhamun. These rulers also coincide with the Amarna period, which was arguably the most inventive phase of Egyptian art. Circa 1295 to 1069 BCE, the Ramses, which is the line of kings named Ramses, are great builders, but their rule is threatened by the military might of the Assyrians. In 525 BCE, Persian king Cambyses II conquers Egypt, which becomes a client state, and in 31 BCE, Mark Antony and Cleopatra are defeated by Roman forces at the Battle of Actium, effectively ending Egypt's independence. You know what's funny right now? It's happening in my real life right now, is that our building has a water leak, so we don't have any water for the night. So, of course, immediately, like, my mouth dries up, but I only have whatever water's left in my water bottle. <laughs> so, like, I'm trying to not drink water. Because that's all I have until tomorrow morning. But, um, moving on. <laughs> that's what I'm dealing with. Let's read about the beginnings of Egyptian art and the sands of time. The origins of Egyptian painting can be traced back to prehistoric times. The artisans of the Nagata culture produced painted pottery, using some motifs that would survive into the dynastic era. The earliest known painted tomb dates back to circa 3100 BCE, and was discovered at the ancient capital Hierakonopolis. The royal cemetery at Saqqara is almost as old, with decorated tombs dating back to as early as the First Dynasty. These include pyramids and the more modest mastabas, which are mud brick burial pal places. Although the contents of Egyptian tombs may appear lavish and artistic to modernize, that was never the intention. Everything in the funeral traditions of ancient Egypt served a common purpose, to protect and sustain the deceased in the afterlife. Paintings were not designed to look realistic or aesthetically pleasing. They were components in a ritual framework that was organized for the benefit of the dead. These practices remained in place for virtually the entire span of Egypt's ancient history. Let's look down at the artistic influences of this time. By the time Saqqara was built, the format for tomb decoration was already well established. Among the themes to feature heavily was agriculture, an, act of, an activity that the deceased might have been associated with during their lifetime. Unsu, the scribe, for example, had been a grain accountant. Agricultural motifs also featured because of the food and provisions that would be needed in the afterlife. So first we have sculpture, as we can see here in the offering chapel of Ta Sekum Ankh. This is located in the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston, Massachusetts. Sculpture was combined with painting in early tombs, producing colored reliefs rather than frescoes. Raids of herdsmen with animals, their sheer variety emphasized the wealth of the deceased. It was a common theme. So these are rock carvings that are painted. They're not exactly wall paintings, isn't that neat? Stylistic regulations dictated the way artists organized their pictures. 
Human figures were shown in profile, although both shoulders were turned to face the front. Scenes are arranged into long horizontal bands known as registers. So here's from the tomb of Unsu that they mentioned before. This scene is located right now in the Louvre in Paris, France, and you can see the registers. And you can see how everyone is torsos facing forward, but their heads are sideways. Very Egyptian, right? Can you believe they had the same art style for 3,000 years? Can you imagine? I mean, it was only a thousand years ago we had, like, the Bayou Tapestry. Imagine 3,000 years of the same art style, never changing. Fascinating, anyway. Hieroglyphs, literally sacred words, were used to amplify the subject of the painting. Images were rarely meant to be viewed in isolation. Tomb paintings tended to be personalized with a theme relating to the deceased. So here's a beautiful painting of the goddess Mat. You can see all the hieroglyphs around her that aren't necessarily the background, they're part of this depiction of her. This can be found in the tomb of Nefertari in the Valley of the Queens in Egypt. Egyptian blue, or blue frit, is often described as the first synthetic pigment. It is a calcium copper silicate produced by fusing powdered limestone with sand and copper filings. It features a Neba moon hunting in the marshes, which is the last work we're going to look at tonight. So here we see some pigments ground up in here. This is from the tomb of Kar and Deir of Medina. And this is located in the Egyptian Museum in Turin, Italy. So let's take a look at this turning point of art, the Mastaba of Tai. It's from the 5th dynasty, 2494 to 2345 BCE. It's located currently at Saqqara near Cairo in Egypt. This is probably the finest of the Saqqara tombs, dating from the Old Kingdom era. Tai was a high-ranking court official. Overseer of the Pyramids of Nuseri was one of his many titles. And his status is reflected in these splendid relief decorations at the Mastaba. Long parades of porters, which is this picture here, bring food, animals, and other goods to serve as offerings. While there are also detailed illustrations, the many activities that Tai supervised, ranging from farming and brewing to making inspections and managing the accounts. Elsewhere on the reliefs, there are a number of more exotic scenes, such as hunting a hippopotamus with harpoons. Let's take a look real quick. So we can see again the rock carvings that are painted over. You can see all the animals that they brought. And you can really tell the, like, you know, how people are bigger than they're supposed to be, because this is like an ibex, you know. But then this is like a duck. It's like the same size as the ibex. It's very complicated, isn't it? But it wasn't meant to make sense. It was meant to be as a ritual, right? It's not meant to look realistic. Let's read real quick about the discovery of Saqqara. This is a fascinating story. The Saqqara tombs were discovered by French Egyptologist and archaeologist Auguste Mariette. An early passion for hieroglyphs had helped him land a job at the Louvre. He, was one of the, he went through that Egypt phase that we all went through as kids. And in 1850, he was sent to Egypt to purchase manuscripts for the museum. Instead, he excavated the site at Saqqara making the sensational finds that secured his reputation. Mariette's determination to eradicate the looting that took place at excavations led to his appointment as conservator of Egyptian monuments and co-founder of the Cairo Museum. He even found time to supply the plot for Verdi's Aida, set in ancient Egypt. Yeah, he was a Egypt nut, wasn't he? All right, let's look at the timeline of Egyptian art. This is my favorite part. Throughout their history, the Egyptians used a diverse array of artifacts for funerary practices. Cold statues, such as those in Rehotep's tomb, were designed to house the ka of the deceased, while adornments on mummy cases were meant to ward off evil. The style of painting remained remarkably consistent, 
with the notable exceptions of the rebellious phase of Akhenaten's reign and the later colonial periods under the influence of Greece and Rome. So we are starting off right about here, about 3000 BCE, in the early dynastic period. The initial early dynastic period includes the creation of a new capital at Memphis, circa 2972 BCE, the historical division into dynasties or royal houses was devised in the 3rd century BCE by Mineto, an Egyptian priest. A little further on we have hieroglyphs. Hieroglyphic forms of script are in general, are in general use throughout Egypt. By circa 2890 BCE, they are widely employed on most paintings, sculptures, and monuments. In 2800 BCE, the first tomb statues. In Saqqara, a royal official founds the earliest known funerary cult chapel in circa 2800 BCE. The first tomb statues belonging to the Pharaonic era also date from this period. As we move on, we see some right here. It's Rahotep and Nofret that you see down here. From the 4th dynasty, circa 2570 BCE, these are located in the Egyptian Museum in Cairo, Egypt. This couple were discovered in a mastaba near Maydum. The painted limestone figures are incredibly lifelike. Strands of Nofret's own hair are even depicted, peeping out from under her wig. Nice. <laughs> Good job to that artist there. We move on to some art down here. This here is of Princess Nefertiabet. Really pretty art here. From the 4th Dynasty. Remember, it's not meant to be pretty, it's meant to be a ritual. <laughs> but it's still pretty. 4th Dynasty in circa 2500 BCE. This is located in the Louvre in Paris, France. This limestone slab discovered at the princess's tomb in Giza shows Nefertiabet, a sister of King Cheops. Clothed in a panther skin dress, she sits before the food and other offerings that she will need in the afterlife. Really neat. And also this is when we have pyramid building. Construction of the magnificent pyramids at Giza begins circa 2550 to 2500 BCE. The monuments to Khufu, Khafre, and Menkore dominate the scene. Those are the three big pyramids that everyone knows. <laughs> So moving down timeline to here, boom, boom, boom. we look at this piece up here. This is transporting grain sacks. I'm sure, you know, these arts don't have tiles, you know, but that's what this they're calling it. This is from the first intermediate period, circa 2100 BCE. This can be found in the Museo Egizio in Turin, Italy. Let me see. Murals from the tomb of Iti at Jebelin reflect the fact that in that region, artistic controls were relaxed due to political divisions within Egypt. Colors are brighter than normal, but the scale is erratic. Yeah, I see what they mean. Look how short this guy is. And the, their heads compared to their bodies, yeah. Interesting. Moving on... Looks like we're going here next. A pretty detail of musical procession from the 11th dynasty circa 2000 BCE. This can be found at the Cincinnati Art Museum in Ohio. Female attendants clap their hands in a section of the decorations from the tomb of Queen Neferu, one of the wives of King Mentehotep II. Her tomb forms part of a large mortuary complex at Deir el Bahari. Let's see next. We're looking at this piece up here. An Asiatic caravan. Look at that. From the 12th dynasty, circa 1880 BCE, this can be found in the Beni Hassan necropolis in Egypt. This detail of the decorations from the tomb of, let me see, um, Kunum Hotep II depicts nomadic traders from Asia bringing offerings for the deceased. The rapid rise in immigration from Asia was a matter of political concern in Egypt. It's a valid one, since they would have invaders. And then at this point we have the beginnings of the Valley of the Kings. 
A royal cemetery is established around circa 1560 BCE in the area now known as the Valley of the Kings. It will become the most important burial site in the New Kingdom. Let's take a moment to look at palettes, which is exactly what you think it is, like an artist's palette where all the paint is. They keep the paint there. This is the Narmer palette, the most famous one, circa 3000 BCE. It can be found in the Egyptian Museum in Cairo. Palettes were practical objects used for grinding pigments, but some early highly decorated examples held a deeper significance. They were given as offerings to temples and employed during rituals. Scholars speculate that they may have been used to produce eye or body paint, which was worn by the priest or daubed on cult statues. In artistic terms, the grinding bowl became a feature of the design used here to shape the necks of fabulous beasts. They look like weird giraffes. Let's see what's next in history. Oh wow. First we're going to talk about Queen Hatshepsut. Work begins on the magnificent temple of Queen Hatshepsut in circa 1460 BCE. Its unusual decorations include scenes of a naval expedition and the transportation of obelisks from the quarries at Aswan. Then, dun -dun, we're looking at... Th this is so amazing. This is the interior of the tomb of Senefer from the 18th dynasty, circa 1410 BCE. This can be found at Sheikh Abd el Kurna in Egypt. Often dubbed the Tomb of the Vines because of the ceiling decoration. This is gorgeous. The 18th dynasty tomb depicts Senefer, the mayor of Thebes, on the far wall, receiving offerings from his wife. Here she is, and there he is. It looks like they're over here, too. Let's see what's next. This one. This is my favorite because it looks alien. Not that they look like aliens, which they kind of do, but, you know, they deviated from the art style during Akhenaten's reign. And so it's Egyptian art that doesn't look anything like Egyptian art. Daughters of Akhenaten, 18th Dynasty, circa 1353-35 to 35 BCE. This is located in Ashmolean in Oxford, UK. Artistic styles altered radically during the reign of Akhenaten, the heretic king. Figures appeared less static and impassive, while the human form was portrayed in a strangely stylized manner. Let's see, next we have the Great Harris Papyrus. This is from the 20th dynasty, circa 1150 BCE. This can be found in the British Museum in London, UK. At 138 feet in length, this is one of the largest surviving papyri. This section shows Ramses III with the principal gods of Memphis, Ta, Sekhmet, and Nefertem. Awesome. That's so neat that that survived for so long. And he's in white right? So, interesting, he's deified. Next we're going to read about the Tanis Necropolis. In circa 800 BCE, the main focus of royal burials shifts away from the Valley of the Kings and to Tanis. These tombs are more modest, though they contain golden treasures. Then we have the Kushite rule. From around 728 BCE, the Egyptians are ruled by the Kushites from the south, which is now the Republic of Sudan. The situation is ended by invading Assyrians who sack Memphis in 671 BCE. Not long after that's the creation of this amazing sarcophagus, the mummy cartonage of, let's, oh my, that's a name, Nespanitjurin Peri. Nespanitjurin Peri. In the 22nd dynasty, circa 945 to 718 BCE, this can be found in the Brooklyn Museum of Art in New York, New York. Cartonage was a material composed of linen or papyrus mixed with plaster and water, and was used to cover a mummy. Various symbols and spells were painted on the surface, designed to aid the deceased, in this case a priest, on their journey to the afterlife. So interesting. You can read about Nectanebo I. A brief period of Egyptian independence begins during the 30th dynasty, circa 380 BCE. Nectanebo I and his successors revive earlier building programs 
enlarging temples and creating avenues of sphinxes than the Ptolemaic dynasty. The Ptolemaic era, when Egypt is ruled by Greeks, begins circa 240 BCE. Alexandria replaces Memphis as the capital and the Hellenistic style affects most branches of the arts. We also have, not long after this begins, the Temple of Edfu. Egyptian architecture enjoys a revival under the Ptolemies. The most impressive building is the Temple of Horus at Edfu, begun by Ptolemy III in 237 BCE and finished in 57 BCE. Then we have the Rosetta Stone. A slab is carved with identical inscriptions in Greek, Demotic, and Hieroglyphic script in 196 BCE. It will eventually provide scholars with the vital clues that they need in order to decipher ancient hieroglyphs. Then right before the year one, we have this remarkable art. Can you believe this is Egyptian art? It looks like a beautiful Greek painting, but there are a lot of Greeks in Egypt at this time. The Fayum portrait of a young woman from the Roman period. Sorry, it's Roman, not Greek. Circa 30 BCE to 120 CE, the Louvre in Paris, France. It's remarkable. So not the Greeks, the Ptolemies, I guess. Yeah, the Ptolemies are done at this point. 30 BCE for sure. Fayum portraits combined the realism of Roman portraiture with the burial practices of the Egyptians. This is an extremely lavish example painted in encaustic, which is a molten wax process, on imported cedar wood, and covered with gold leaf decoration. Amazing. It's so pretty. And then Egypt becomes a Roman province. Following defeat at the Battle of Actium the previous year, Mark Antony and Cleopatra end their lives in 30 BCE. Egypt now becomes a Roman province unalived themselves, right? Let's look at the Book of the Dead. Look at Osiris right here. The Judgment of Osiris. This is what happens when we die according to the ancient Egyptians. Oh, it's a cool picture. This is from circa 332 to 330 BCE. Designed to aid the deceased in their voyage into the afterlife, Book of the Dead is the collective name given to an anthology of spells and instructions. These texts could be inscribed in tombs or on coffins, but the most elaborate were personalized for the deceased and written on long papyrus scrolls. Many featured a series of painted vignettes, culminating in the judgment of Osiris, the god of the dead. He's painted green, you can't really tell him this, but he's always depicted as having green skin, which kind of eerie, right? It's kind of corpse-like. Lastly, we're going to look at this remarkable piece of art. Oop, if I can actually turn the page, there we go. Let's read the box first and then we'll look at it. This is Neba Moon hunting in the marshes. It's from the 18th dynasty, circa 1350 BCE. It can be found in the British Museum in London. This fresco is justly considered to be one of the finest examples of Egyptian tomb painting. It belonged to a series of frescoes that decorated the resting place of the scribe Nebamun, who, according to hieroglyphs at the site, counts the grain in the granary of divine offerings. It formed part of a larger scene that also included Nebamun spearing fish. Although that portion has not survived, a fragment of the spear can be seen in the lower left corner of the painting. Let's take a look real quick at the lower left corner. There it is. There's a big old fish right here getting speared, and sadly this part has been lost. I wonder what happened. At first glance, the scene may look like a faithful representation of an activity that Nepa Moon might have enjoyed during his lifetime. This would be misleading, though, because Egyptian art always served a, de a deeper purpose. Nepa Moon would never have hunted while wearing his wig and an ornate collar, his wife would not have accompanied him dressed for a banquet, nor would their child have been present. Let's take a look. There's Nepa Moon hunting in the marshes, and he's all dressed up in his finest. There's his wig and his jewelry there. His wife all adorned out in gold, and these cones they'd wear on their head that had scented, like, wax and oil inside that would drip down into their hair as the night wore on. 
And there's his kid. I assume a girl because of her skin color, right? Interesting. It's really beautiful. Look at- I love all the animals. It talks about it in this next paragraph here. In fact, the scene is full of symbolic references to fertility and rebirth that are linked to a solar cult. Two lotus buds and a lotus flower are draped prominently over Nepa Moon's right arm. You can see it right here. These are traditional attributes to the sun god Ra, who is often portrayed reclining on a lotus. Gold was an emblem of the sun, and a tiny speck of gold leaf, its only use in the painting, is found in the eye of the cat, an animal sacred to Ra's daughter, the goddess Bastet. The cat's position, balancing him probably on a reed and gazing up at Neba Moon, coupled with the presence of the gold leaf, signals that its presence is symbolic. So check it out, there's a kitty cat, and it's balanced on a reed there. He's looking up at Nepa Moon and his eye. You can't really tell in this photograph, but he's the gold leaf for the eye, which makes me think it's more like, oh, he's got a bird too. It's like how, you know, when cats are in the dark and the light kind of like shines on their eyes and it reflects back, I think. That's why they put the gold there, but it's a symbolic cat. It's not a real cat. Very interesting, this combination of realism and and everything else it seems like it is a very remarkable piece so that's going to be it for tonight thank you so much for watching i hope that you found this video relaxing and educational and i hope that you have a very good 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 night good night good night